Hi folks, welcome to this episode of the Physical Education Podcast. Today I spoke with Ian Shepard of Ian Shepard uh, Rehabilitation. He is a therapist trained in many, many different things. Uh, our particular area of interest today in this episode was the area of emotions. Ian has studied uh, what's called cellular release therapy and he has had a lot of experience with working on the emotional side of pain. And um, yeah, we had such a good chat. We, we talked very, very deeply about just how... I think one of the big messages that we, we discussed was how emotional issues are, they're just everywhere and you probably have them even if you think you don't have them. And what I'm hoping is that uh, today's chat will kind of highlight highlight that to you and kind of create a, a safe um, space and opportunity for you to begin to consider the emotional side of your pain because people can be very, you know, they're very iffy and, you know, it's a bit taboo and you don't want to talk about it. And I think Ian pre presents a very, um, a very accessible way of beginning to dip your toes in emotional work without, you know, lying on a couch like Freud and, you know, crying about your mother, uh, <laughs> which, you know, I understand the fear surrounding that. So, um, yeah, I really, really enjoyed this chat. This one was uh, one of my favorite. Really, really good. Uh, I'm excited to to actually do some work with Ian. I talk about this at the end. Uh, but anyway, I'm rambling, I'm rambling. Check out this episode. You're going to learn lots of, uh, lots of stuff, uh, lots of resources, and lots of thought-provoking information. So, uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy it. Welcome, Ian. How are you? How are things? Welcome to the I'm, show. I'm good, thank you. And thank you for inviting me to the show. You're very welcome. I'm just going to be candid. Like, we're, we're laughing now because we just, we narrowly avoided a disaster of me not pressing record. I noticed uh, about 10 seconds into the show that I hadn't properly started recording. So those are the, the reasons for the giggles. Uh, anyway, uh, Ian, thank you for coming on. So I brought you on um, specifically because you have experience very much in the realm of emotions and pain. And I think that's one of the areas that people don't seem to grasp. They don't really seem to. It's not very tangible. You know, we understand the mobility. We understand to some degree nutrition. But the area of emotions and pain, it's just a bit, it's a bit taboo and it's a bit intangible. And I think you've got some, some great experience, some great case studies. Um, so I was hoping we could discuss that. So to get us going, could you give us a bit of a background of what you do and how you came to do what you do? Yeah. Um, many years ago, I started off personal training. I think that's most people's roots when they mm. start going down rehabilitation routes. But I also found quickly, and it dawned on me that you treat, you know, you're taking clients into the gym and having no sort of concept of what you can do with them. You know, you're going on a personal training course and you think, well, you know, you know everything. Hmm. And then, you know, I was always scared to say if somebody had back pain, or oh, you can't do this, you can't do that. And it was also a thing back in the day where back pain was a serious thing. So I started going off down different routes, down the Czech, uh, Paul Czech stuff, holistic side, um, then approach across DNS, which I like and use quite a lot. Um, and then I sort of went on to NKT, PDTR, uh, emotional stuff was the next sort of big thing for me, cellular release therapy and heart of Elijah. And then um, I think at the age, I must have been about 30, I'd had a car crash at 22 and I suffered a lot of knee knee and uh, shoulder pain down the same side on the right side. And basically I spent nine, ten years trying to correct the problem, if not longer. And everybody just said, oh, it's probably a nerve problem because where you bang your head on the window screen mm. and it's probably just a nerve problem. So... I don't know how much I spent. I must have spent in excess of £10,000 probably. I mm. must have seen most top therapists in the UK and even travelled across to the States to see people. And in the end, I come across, uh, I think it was Jamie Francis sort of mentioned about she took cellular release therapy. Yeah. And um, I thought, well, I'd try this, you know, just mm. for the last go, just see if, you know, if it's going to achieve anything because I heard some good stuff that it, you know, gets rid of quite a lot of pain. Yeah clears um, intolerances and um, all kinds of problems and conditions. So I started doing the work of that and then I eventually got my um, 
shoulder pain fixed. And it was literally uh, related back to a trauma I suffered when I was about eight or nine. And most people would look back and say, well, how can this mm. be, you know, how can these problems, you know, from childhood relate to your problems now? Yeah. Because everything is stored within the subconscious mind. You know, the subconscious mind never forgets anything what happens until it's cleared. So once yeah. I'd cleared this trauma of pulling a brick out, a painful of my shoulder went away. Yeah. Uh, and then I started looking at things from a different perspective, you know, and I thought, well, most things are related to emotional problems. Yeah. But most people don't want to go down that route. So it was just something where I got into and and then I started working with my clients, finding things related to clients and just clearing stuff, you know, what they've had for years. Yeah. And it's it's a real eye opener, really, because most people, like I say, just avoid anything to do with emotions. Hmm. And you mentioned so you had tried many different things, a lot of the yeah. big therapies, uh, and yeah. some very good therapies. You know, PDTRs. Um, I don't like to get too bogged down in this therapy versus that no. therapy, but I think no. some definitely stand above others. Yeah, uh, and I think PDTR is one of those. But so you you did that. Um, and you found cellular release therapy. Was that your first introduction to really looking at emotions? Or had you experience of dealing with emotions before then? No, not really. Because I, I think it's like, you know, most people are too scared to go down that route. Mm. You know, and I think that's... Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, the, cellular release was a sort of first time. Because, I, you know, I didn't really want to go and sit and talk to somebody. Yeah. Talk therapy. Sure. Because... You know what's to talk about yes it might help in short term mm. but you know long term you know if, you, if you're not dealing with the subconscious mind yeah. and only the conscious mind mm. these problems tend to never go away yeah so when they said oh it's a hypnosis based treatment i thought well what's it about i thought i'll try it once just to see what it's like mm. and there is no sort of um, when you go in for treatment you know there's no sort of questioning why you've done what you've done Okay. It's literally be going in, you've been treated, what's your experiences? Mm. I fell over, hurt my hand, I fell over, hurt my head. And it's just literally clearing the experiences from them problems, you know, okay. and that's as easy as it becomes. And once I'd found out what was behind it all, I was quite happy to sit, you know, and go through my complete trauma list of clearing stuff, what's happening in my life. Yeah. And one thing I've... I'm very much concerned myself with is understanding what's really going on. So I've got a similar story in terms of I tried this, then tried that, then tried that, yeah. and nothing, you know, you try all the things that you're supposed to try and they don't work. Yeah. And what I'm fascinated by is the fact that there's about 20 billion different therapies, you know, NKT, PDTR, yeah. AIM, all that, yeah. DNS, and they all seem to work for some people sometimes. So what's, you know, is it about the therapy or is it about what the therapy offers you at a specific point, at a key point in your life? So and my question is, with that in yeah. mind, um, do you believe that your recovery was about addressing emotions in a broad sense or about cellular release therapy specifically or a combination of the two? I think with treatment nowadays, I mean, what you'll find, for example, if somebody has a spinal manipulation and then what they say is a general thing, come back in six months for a maintenance. Mm. So if you're going back in six months for a maintenance, you're not really fixing the problem. Yep. Um, and I think sometimes when you go for rehab, it will last for so long, but seven, eight years, possibly down the line, these things might come back to haunt you. Mm. And in, until you deal, I mean, they've always said I've been on a lot of courses, I mean, where they say emotions always top priority yeah. over anything else. Mm. You know, you can fix everything with emotions. Yeah. Yes, you might need some rehab to like, you know, stabilize joints, etc. Mm. But I, th I think a lot of the time when you can go in for treatment, you feel better. And I've seen it no end of times in myself where I've been in for treatment and I felt good, come away. But truly, sometimes the treatment only lasts for two or three days and it's back again. Yeah. Um, 
and you always get the same thing. Oh, it's layers. Oh, you need to get rid of this layer. You need to get rid of that mm. layer. And I, I don't think it's a case. You know, I've, I've seen it myself with, when I've worked with people. You say, oh, you might have like three or four sessions doing this to get rid of this knee pain. And then you can do something else and it's gone within a session. Yeah. So I, I just think, I always think there's, if you don't want to do the emotions, then you go down the other routes to fix your problems. But if, yeah. you, if you're happy to do the emotional work and get something, get rid of pain completely, then, you know, that's what I would recommend. Yeah. And so do you feel like you could have gotten better <laughs> through other emotional techniques, say something like somatic experiencing or um, I forget even the names off the top of my head, but they're, yeah. you know, within the realm of therapies, ones that focus on emotions, there are tons of them and cellular yeah. release therapy is one. Do you feel like um, cellular release there, maybe we'll say CRT from now yeah. on, CRT <laughs> offers, <laughs> uh, do you think CRT offers something unique that others or most others can't offer? Or do you think it's, you know, had you gone down another emotional route, you would have had the same benefits? I can't really say, to be honest. I mean, sure. all, some of the people who I've seen, who I see at the moment, have gone down other routes mm. and they still have emotional problems. Yeah. Um, I'm always under the influence. If something doesn't work, try something else until yeah. you find something that works for you. Sure. And I think that's probably the clearest way to put it. I mean, mm. you know, it's a bit like saying some people say PDTR is good and some people say DNS is great, you know. Yeah. And it's, I think it's whatever works for the client. But, it, yeah, I can't really sort of say, oh, something else is no good. Sure, yeah. I, I just literally find that the people who work with CRT generally get better clearings. But that's, mm. you know, yeah. that's just a personal preference for me. Sure. And I, I, I ask because my what I've seen, and I think it's most people's experience, is that you're always looking for the thing, you know, yes. oh, it's CRT. And someone listening to this who hasn't found relief is going to be thinking, okay, I need CRT now. Yeah. And maybe they do, but I want to, I want to give credit where credit is due in terms yeah. of therapies that are above mm. others. But I yeah. also want to avoid this kind of mindset of this is the fix uh, yeah. and really create that bit of space where people can say, okay, maybe this is going to help, but I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to outsource my recovery to this three letter acronym, you know, or to this no. external uh, idea. And so uh, I think we'll, we'll come back to um, what makes cellular release or CRT, CRT um, <laughs> unique and talk maybe about yeah. the mechanisms in a bit. Uh, to kind of lay a bit of, of a foundation, I think it might be worth kind of establishing the relevance of emotions to pain. So yeah. how, if someone comes into you, how do you, what analogies or what, how do you explain how thoughts and emotions can manifest physically and how that can lead to pain? Yeah. So when we continually exposed to emotions or um, emotional pain, whether that might be arguments with them in the family, um, having a lost one, you know, difficulty in the relationship with somebody. This obviously changes the way the brain produces. Um, it depends. Well, uh, emotional pain is there, and obviously it produces a dependency on these. The brain. A little depend. I'll get it right in a minute. Take your time. <laughs> yeah, it changes well, obviously emotional pain. When we're exposed to emotional pain, obviously these changes in the brain that produce a dependency on these feelings. So, and while this emotional can be significant, it continues for a prolonged period of times, it will probably end up affecting physical health. So you'll end up getting pain in joints, etc. So hmm. when you're stressed, anxious, or, or the body, or upset, your body reacts in a way that tells you that something might be wrong. Yeah. So you, for example, you might end up with high blood pressure, stomach ulcers, uh, pain within joints etc mm. yeah. so obviously neg negative attitudes and feelings can create chronic stress yeah which um upsets the body's hormone balance uh, depletes uh, depletes depletes 
depletes the brain's chemicals required for happiness hmm. and then damages the immune system, which are all common things we see from day to day in treatment. You know, people are stressed, have an immune system problems, get colds regular, etc., etc. Yeah. So chemicals are released by the brain in response to happiness. These are um, dopamine, serotonin, and morphine, uh, endorphins. So obviously sometimes the other thing when we look at, um, when we have an imbalance, say for example, a serotonin, which is a common thing, what you hear across a nutritional mm. spectrum. Yeah. Obviously these increase anger, pain, anxiety, etc. cetera. Yeah. Um, and often um, physical pain functions as a warning to a person that's still emotional. For me, there'd be emotional work to be done. Yeah. So pain is entirely a subjective phenomenon sure. um, that just really the brain's response to perception of threat. Yeah. So when you look at somebody, say, you know, sometimes the first thing we need to do, and this is not what sometimes when they come in for and they think, well, you've, you've shot me now because I don't think I've got pain in my shoulder. Mm. You know, we need to stop the... Um, we we'll need to fix the chemicals going to the brain and um, to impair normal healing. Yeah. And people say, well, I've just got pain in my shoulder. Can you not just fix the pain in my shoulder? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's all about fixing probably the emotional side first. And this is where people are, have difficulty understanding to fix a shoulder. Mm. See, once the stress levels go down, you know, all the stress around the shoulder will drop off. Yeah. And there only be a little bit of rehab as opposed to a lot. Sure. Yeah. So it's um, yeah, it's very difficult to get that across to people, but um, you know, sometimes you have to give people what they want instead of what they actually need. Sure. Um, yeah. And for for me, I'd always start with the emotions. I always bring it up in every session I have with somebody, a new client, and if they're not open to it, or for some reason they can't do it. Mm. Um, then that's fine. Do you know what I mean? But I think yeah. people have to be aware that, you know, just because your shoulder hurts, it's not purely down to the mechanics of, you know, your working shoulder. Yeah. I think, I mean, it's it's just the reality of everything affects everything and, and nothing is happening in isolation. Yeah. And if you, say, have a, a career-ending shoulder injury, it's not just the shoulder injury, it's the career end. It's the change and disruption of your life. It's yeah. all of these interactions that happen. And I think um, it's sort of, in, well, it is very intuitive for most people once they start thinking about it that way. If you paint this picture of the, the example I always use is, you know, you're a captain of the football team, you're going places, you're, you're doing really yeah. well, your life is kind of, your community is the, the sports club. And an injury disrupts everything and yeah. the next 20 years of your life were dependent on your body functioning a certain yes. way and you being part of this community and like mm. that that is kind of shattered and all of this kind of ripples out and unfolds over time so when you think about it that way in this kind of very blunt example you can see but a lot of these things are very very subtle and yeah. In your own story, you mentioned um, the history of, of an injury. I think you said you were nine. Yeah. And so, in your opinion, what do you, do you think, why did the issue not heal itself back then? You know, why has it persisted this long? Or can um, you speculate? Yeah. Um, I think when we experience trauma, the subconscious mind will store this trauma. Hmm. And until the subconscious mind has cleared the trauma, it will remain constantly stuck in the subconscious mind. Yeah. So, and obviously as, as time goes on, when we don't deal with a trauma, it's, everything gets stockpiled. Yeah. And then when things get stockpiled, things get full, and then obviously it manifests probably into the body more and more and more. Yeah. So until you deal with these problems, they just don't go away. But I can't... Um, I'm trying to think, but why it never went away, mm. I probably can't really explain that. I can only sort of explain it from the subconscious mind, yeah. And it, you know, and that's where we think, you know, like I say, it doesn't forget, yeah, and it just stores trauma, 
and like I mean you don't you don't have to explain it as well I don't want to no. yeah um th the way I sort of think about it is I I did a, a short course in what's called uh, brain spotting and yeah. it's based on I'm not sure if you've heard of it but it's based on like eye movement uh, I think it's called EMDR and oh, right it's similar to in PDTR when you work with emotions and you look at eye yeah. directions. And this is very much a subjective explanation of, of things. Mm. But I know that when you're talking about things and when you're remembering things, you're looking in different directions. Yeah. And to me, it's as if you've got this kind of consciousness is like this space yeah. and you orient your attention towards certain pieces of information or certain experiences mm. or emotions and traumatic experiences can kind of be contained so your yeah. body wants to avoid them and it essentially like creates this wall around it to contain it yeah. to distract you from it in the same way that if you break your ankle you shift your weight off it and you yes. avoid re-stimulating that um, and what I've noticed through treating people is that you can with their eye position you can suddenly bring up all sorts of traumatic information if you hit that spot that they've been avoiding. So I think yeah. about it like it's like this dark room, this, you know, consciousness, whatever, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. It's this little contained thing that you're protecting yourself from. Yeah. And you're drawing attention to that and you're giving it no option but to come to to uh, to consciousness. Yeah. And that's what I imagine sort of happens is that if you're depleted in resources, if it's easier to just ignore it, then you're going to just keep compensating around that. And sorry, go, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I had a client, well, when I was using PDT, emotional stuff, um, which was quite funny, you know, and that, same again, you're looking at eye position and you mm. think, well, what are they avoiding? So you get to talk to you about whatever it may be, what's bothering them. Yeah. So when I say to them, right, you're avoiding, I can see, you can see which way they're avoiding. Mm. So I say, now, can you look up to this top corner? And yeah. I said, talk to me about the same problem again. And I had one person looked up there, went to talk and said, no, literally just said no, because mm. they, they knew if they'd been up that way, it would have brought tears and yeah. all emotions yeah. up. Sure. And, and that's, again, it's a way of avoiding stuff where you don't want to go. Mm. And you, you could say that that's sort of if if you're um you know a trauma doctor person comes in with a broken ankle and you say step on that ankle and they're just going to say no because <laughs> they know they know consciously and unconsciously that that's just going to hurt and that's a bad yeah. idea. So yeah. the way I think about it is that it, it's likely something like that that um it's just that it's operating at this largely unconscious and very well hidden um state. And so I think this this might bring us to the CRT specifically. And I think that yeah. the name is really, really interesting. And it, it um, yeah, so cellular release therapy. So it, it conveys this idea that there are things or emotions held in the cells and we're releasing those. Could you yeah. maybe give us a bit of a rundown of what CRT is? And we can start from there. Yeah, cell, cell release therapy is obviously based on the hypnosis. So anybody who comes for CRT will be put into a hypnosis state, hmm. um, totally conscious of what's going on. Um, it's not like you see on telly where they're doing wacky things and running around and doing everything they asked to do. Yeah. No, you're totally conscious, but you're just in a hypnotic state so we can access the subconscious mind. Sure. Um, and, and literally, we go in and just clear experiences. Say, so if you've had a difficulty in the relationship with an ex-partner, that's something, you know, you would clear. And you just ask for the experiences and say, can we ask what the experiences may be? Oh, he cheated on me 10 times. Can you clear, you know, then I say, can you clear the experience of this? And usually with cellular release therapy, there's, you clear fears, you clear beliefs around this habits and patterns so if you keep constantly doing the same thing that's probably a habit and pattern and you mm. clear that as well okay um and it's just literally just going through the experiences of what the client suffered from that in that relationship mm. and then you go through to a complete clearing where there's 
all other questions where you clear um, feeling rejected, feeling and all other things along them lines where you can clear stuff. Yeah. So it's like a complete clearing of, you know, the thoughts, you know, sabotaging your own life or sabotaging your own relationships with people, you know, and, then, and that's where it sort of breaks off and just clears the whole complete pattern okay. of things, what's probably happened in that relationship. Hmm. So that's sort but of that, like in PDTR, you would talk about a priority top of the fractal and yes. it has all these branches out. Um, so it could be relationships, but maybe, you know, where does that pattern come from? And so you're clearing all of these things, but you can clear sort of the top priority and the key yeah. key sort of issue. And when you say release, is this kind of, um, is this sort of a, an abstract thing or is this like, you know, it's, I presume it's not release in the sense of a soft tissue release. No, I mean, what you'll find, it will take tension without the muscle. So yeah. there's, there's no need for a massage as such, in my opinion, because it just literally gets rid of tension. Yeah. Um, like I say, you know, one session is not going to fix hmm. everything. Sure. You know, all your tension in your body, you know, sometimes you have to clear because this work is deep and a lot of things are very deep, you know, hmm. and it's passed on, which we'll probably talk about later from child to mother, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, literally I say, can you release and clear all of this now? So what happens, the body's releasing this trauma, whatever you experience. And once you've cleared, you can lift your fingers because you only you literally talk with your fingers. You don't mm. answer. You just say you've got an index finger for yes and a little pinky finger for no. So okay. when the experience is cleared, raise your finger to let me know. And then after that, it's cleared and it's done. Yeah. And then you move on to the next experience. So... Um, let me see if I have this generally right. So you're yeah. quietening the more active chatter of the conscious mind and yeah. you're communicating with the unconscious mind. The subconscious, yeah. The, yeah. So do you make a distinction between unconscious and subconscious? Well, when you're in a hypnotic state, you'll be using the subconscious mind. Subconscious. That's the only way oh, you yeah, can act. Yeah. It's funny. I I hear so many different things on that's a separate topic yeah. it doesn't really matter yeah. uh, so we will say uh subconscious is that that yeah. correct yes. yes subconscious yeah okay so you're communicating with the subconscious mind and are you basically sort of asking it to do something and giving it direction giving it direction to do yeah giving it a direction to clear that that experience if it's willing to yeah and if it's not then you have a resistance protocol where you have to find out a way to clear it through the resistance protocol. Okay, so you kind of work around that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have a few, a few different tangents to go on from here. You mentioned, and I was reading on your website, the idea of idiomotor signals. So you're using a finger for yes, a finger for no. Yeah. So could you explain that to to those who who aren't uh, familiar? Yeah. When when you ask, when you're in a hypnosis state, there can only be one answer. And the subconscious, like I said to you before, never forgets. Um, okay. So when I ask you a question, say, is there more than 10 experiences of back pain, for example? Yeah. That would be an easy one to say. Sure. And if there's only 10, and if I say, is there more than 10? It, and you'd be only be able to lift one of the fingers up. Okay. So it would always be a yes finger or a no finger. So the response is, when you ask the questions, the yes finger would be only 10 experiences and then i say is there more than 10 and you go no so you can only lift one of the fingers up in response to a question okay and that's how and that's how you'd clear experiences yeah and i like this is another thing with idiomotor uh, signals or idiomotion i've heard different you know i don't know that there's a consensus on what it is so just to be clear about what we're talking about is is this dependent on being in a hypnotic state or is this something that yeah. can be experienced uh, consciously no because no. everything is stored within the subconscious mind so you have to be in a subconscious state or hypnotized as yeah. we class it to clear these experiences you can't click you know you can only clear so much from the conscious mind okay so until you get into that subconscious mind you know it's very difficult to clear these you know traumas which are being carried for quite a long while sure and do you think that the 
I, I kind of think about it as being similar to the way we do muscle testing in PDTR, but that that can work on well maybe it's it's working on a subconscious level. Um, do you feel like that is completely different? Because I know some people do self muscle testing. Is that a completely yeah. different thing? I think people do. No, yeah. I mean, that's not within the subconscious mind. That's you know sometimes if your thoughts are too much within the pulling, yeah, then obviously you can influence the answer. Okay, so um, I might just explain that for for anyone who's who's not familiar. So in therapies, uh, for example, PDTR, we use muscle testing and you yeah. use a test to um, determine the effect of a stimulus on on the body. So what yeah. some people will do is they will ask themselves something and they'll use like a finger uh, ring test. I can't remember what it's called, but yeah. if you pull, you would establish what a yes and a no is. And is my name PA? Yes. Is my name John? No, it's not. Uh, you know, but you would ask better questions. Um, and so <laughs> what I've, um, what I practice myself uh, through sort of meditation is just introspection and kind of feeling for you know what you know i sort of ask myself what should i do should i do this or where is this problem rooted and i'll bring up mm. i do a lot of emotional work myself but i've never done crt and no. um you know i just kind of do it in this intuitive way um but that would be different because it's not working at this hypnotic level would you say no. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, there is some meditation. People say, oh, the axis of subconscious mind, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really go deep enough. You can't access it deep enough. Okay. And go into a hypnotic state, you can access it very deep. Yeah. And with in terms of inducing the hypnotic state, is that um, is that the kind of cliche of holding, you know, the... <laughs> the... <laughs> no, it's just it's a relaxation paper. And yeah. there's many papers about which you can use and you just send the body into relaxation and then you say, and then you ask, is the sub subconscious mind ready to work? Is it wh where it needs to be? Okay. And it's either going to be yes or not. If no, you need to do some deeper uh, progressions to get it into um, into the subconscious relaxation, the subconscious mind, basically. Sure. Um, and a, a lot of your cases, um, your sort of case studies on your website and your social media uh, it seems to place an emphasis on childhood trauma or childhood experiences. Yeah. Are we, would you generally say that we're more susceptible to emotional trauma in those early years versus later? Right. Um, this one gets a little, a little deep. Um, that, that's fine by me if, yeah. if you're happy. <laughs> <clears throat> right. Um, before I always say to people before having children, <clears throat> you must be emotional and your nutritional stable mm -hmm. before having children. Sure. And, and anybody can have children, a drug head, mm. you know, somebody who's on tablets all the time, medication, you know, it's anybody. Yeah. Um, it doesn't mean it's right. Um, but what happens, um, for example, the case where if somebody has a miscarriage, then the next child will fill this miscarriage okay. before it's even born. So the child or the fetus will pick up on everything the mother is feeling inside. Before it's even born, you'll be installing emotions into this child. Hmm. And so obviously when it's born, some people have troublesome childs. Yeah. And but they can't you think, you know, they're blaming oh, I was just a child. Mm. But it's the emotional problem energetically what the child is picking up on. Yeah. So sometimes some things are imprinted into the child before it's even born. Okay. So and this is where again it's important for a mother to be emotionally stable and nutritionally stable because a fetus feeds on everything the mother's given it. Mm. Not just the physical nutrition but the thoughts yes yeah. the thoughts and so some sorry no keep going yeah. yeah yeah so sometimes obviously when this child's born you know it might have problems mm. you know it, if it's born with something then sometimes you can't change what that's born with so if it's born with um asperger's or something along them lines it's very difficult to change 
you know, if they've got Tourette's, they're born with Tourette's, again, that's very difficult to change. But a lot of things, it is possible to change, but you have to work with the mother and with the child, more so with the mother, because mm. energetically the child's still picking up on all this trauma. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And um, I have a couple of questions there, but just one thing uh, going back. So this sort of whole idea of passing on you know, your, yeah, your, your thoughts and, and imprinting yeah. your thoughts, your fears, your phobias, your traumas yeah. onto your child um, during gestation. Mm. What sort of, because I, I'm sure, you know, I'm, I'm totally open to, th to this kind of stuff and it seems very intuitive, but I know that someone listening will be, well, you know, citation needed or this kind of stuff, you know, whereas, yeah. you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson hasn't talked about this, therefore it's not real. Is there... Does this pertain to a specific field of science or study um, that people could look into more? Or is this more uh, intuitive, which I would say is perfectly legitimate? Yeah, um, I've never seen no scientific stuff. You know, mm. I think they've done. I did read somewhere sometimes emotions are present at birth. I read somewhere on a paper somewhere. Yeah. And I can't remember what the paper was, but sure. um I think like a lot of it, you know, because emotion is very spiritual stuff, you mm. know, and you've got to be open to change. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I just don't think from what I know there's any papers to suggest that this is out there. But, you yeah. know, from people working within this field, and, you know, we've seen changes, especially across CRT, Heart of Elijah stuff, what we use, that, you know, this stuff has a profound effect on create you know creating people's better health sure and i mean there it's another rabbit hole of the whole scientific community of what gets research and why and yeah. agendas and that kind of stuff so i think mm. for anyone for anyone listening who's like well until there's a double blind um controlled trial on this i'm not going to believe it i think you need to you need to understand uh, how mm. the industry works a bit and and maybe just remain open to these things so yeah uh, i think ultimately the proof is in the pudding you know if it works it works yeah. and that's it uh we shouldn't necessarily get bogged down but i just wanted to make sure that we kind of address that um so the other thing i was interested in is you mentioned there you should probably if there's an issue with the child you you would be possibly better off treating the mother or treating the parent yes um could you expand on that yeah, um, I had a um, personal case because it's one of my own family cases where you have to look at, you know, I looked at my wife and I said, um, you know, my son was having problems. He, st he had problems staying dry. You know, if you go on the Internet, you see all the scientific research of basically saying, oh, it could be posture, you know, that arbitrator nerve could be trapped. Mm. It could be uh, problems with bowel movements. You know, this is blocking things again yeah. you know and I've read no end of things on there and um, and it come back to the you know I've done a little bit of work with my wife and seen some improvements in my own son with regards to bedwetting and then I said to her I said you know because he always had a fear of being upstairs on his own at night time going to bed hated it you know it created no end of problems with us um, and then we decided, I said, right, let's, I said, have you got any problems? I said to my wife, you know, going upstairs, you know, mm. being upstairs on your own, etc." And she said, yes. Okay. So, and this is about two years into treatment. Um, and I said, right. So we cleared about six experiences of being upstairs. And the next day he was dry because that's, this is how quick it sometimes works. It's, it's yeah. literally the next day. Wow. And ever since then, I think, oh, it's, January, February time, and he's been dry since. No accidents, no nothing. And what you see sometimes when people try to fix these problems with tablets, etc., you'll see a relapse because obviously there's obviously still a problem. Yeah, yeah. But people don't see the emotional connection. When you get rid of, when you break the emotional connection, the problem goes away. Mm. And and the other thing, what we had to do as well. It's because Ben, or my son, had such an attachment to his mum, she couldn't go anywhere without him dragging along. Mm. 
So I had to get some remote work done from him by a couple of uh, Anne and Robert in America who do uh, Heart of Elijah work. And I remember speaking to Anne on, the, on Skype after, and she goes, it's going to be hell for three weeks at least. Okay. And she wasn't wrong. And, you know, she said, just be calm around him because the child should really disconnect from the mother about seven. And he didn't do that. Yeah. And so Anne had to go in and change that pattern and fix a problem for him to disconnect. But yes, it, it was very difficult for three weeks. But then all of a sudden, you know, he wasn't bothered when his mum went out. Okay. And again, that's just, again, it's, I think it highlights the fact that, you know, the mother is a key in treating a lot of children's problems. Yeah. And do you think that's um, through the the physical connection through... Uh, giving birth and through yes. gestation and that um, or is it, it well uh, it's obviously going to be that but is there also then just the 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 presence through uh, through the upbringing is that also very important yeah the, the yeah. emotional attachment between mother and child is very strong very yeah. very strong you know sure. and you know if that doesn't break naturally um, I think they they're very strong up to about seven and 7 to 14, they disconnect a bit more. And then 14 to 21, they'll disengage from the parent. Sure. The next point I kind of wanted to ask you about is what I've I've sort of been studying this whole idea of subconscious, um, essentially programming and where our beliefs come from and yeah. how we're kind of shaped by our early experiences. And what I've heard repeatedly, which might fit in well with, with the work that you do, is this idea that up to about the age of seven, our brain is in essentially a hypnotic state uh, or close to hypnotic state where we're just sort of absorbing information. We're like sponges and we're not really at that state of thinking critically and being able to think more abstractly. Is that consistent with uh, with what you found? Um, what I find generally is most 90% of the time we're in our subconscious mind. Probably yeah. ten ten percent ish. We're probably in the conscious mind. So obviously, all the uh, conscious mind is what we think and what we feel every day. Mm. Uh, the subconscious mind generally is when our uh, everything that's happening within our body or within our life, the behaviours, fears, beliefs, patterns, and the way we um, see ourselves is the subconscious mind. So if, if I said to you, the subconscious mind is an example of it is if you drive somewhere so like you drive to work hmm. and you get to work and you think oh, I don't remember going through that village I don't remember driving hmm. down that road yeah and then another example is say like brushing your teeth you don't go into the bathroom in the morning and think oh, I must take off the toothpaste lid I must squeeze it out into my toothbrush and put the toothbrush in my mouth and brush my teeth sure the, these are all done spontaneously yeah. So that's that's a great, you know, that's a great indication that the subconscious mind is doing all these things, what we think, what we're doing. Um, but you're probably thinking about going to the gym, going to the supermarket while you're brushing teeth or driving your car. Yeah. So it's, and that's where I think, you know, 90% or could even be 95% of the time we're just stuck in the subconscious mind. So whether you class that as a hypnotic state or being in the subconscious mind, yeah, you know, it's just whether I don't know how you define between sure. the two. Yeah, I think a lot of this is there aren't necessarily very clearly defined terms yeah. across disciplines. But would you say that in the in those first seven ish years that we are very susceptible to suggestion and that our our sort of beliefs about the world and our beliefs about our place in the world are strongly imprinted in that that window? Yes, possibly. Yes. Yeah. Versus because... like. You know, if you were versus now, I'm not under the same amount of influence from, yeah. I don't know, say advertising or something. I, yeah, I think maybe not. <laughs> no. Yeah, no, I think when when I do a lot of clearings for people, you know, there's always a question: When did this happen? Yeah. So was it prior conception, preconception? Was it at conception, or was it when you was a month old, a year old? And most things fit. Below, I would say below seven years old. It's yeah. very rarely, you know, it does go sometimes above seven, um, but most of the time it's either preconception, at the time of conception, or two or three months old. 
Okay. So yeah, you you're probably on the on the right lines. So it, it would be quite common that so if someone um had an issue sort of prior to conception, how would you would you need to know what that is or do you clear it? No, and this is where people get bogged down with stuff. You know, sometimes yeah. you don't. You know, all you need to do is clear it. You know, if mm. you start thinking about, well, I don't know when it was preconception or conception. I, I don't know. Yeah. And, and and literally, I think I had one a similar um, uh, a thought form where somebody has said something to me as a younger child, and it created a lot of problems for me. Um, yeah. It was cleared, and I said to Anne, I said, "Well, what was it?" You know. She goes, you don't need, you know, don't think about it. You don't need to know when it was. It's cleared and you mm. can just move on with your life. Yeah. I think people get too bogged down and trying to think, oh, when did this happen or why did it happen? And sure. it's just, li- you know, literally CRT is just about clearing experiences and, and sort of moving on. Yeah. And so in that sense, is the treatment dependent on a therapist leading you through the process? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. it's a one-to-one therapist. So... I, you know, I treat people over Skype or in yeah. person, um, and literally we just go for a clearing of stuff. I mean, a guy has to answer all the well. The client comes to me with all the problems of a, a topic, yeah, and then I clear all the problems, and then you go on to the next on to the next topic on sure. the next session. So it's just one session at a time. Yeah, um, because again, one of the kind of main topics I want to kind of push forward or ideas is self-efficacy and not feeling dependent on someone else but obviously if if you need someone else to do it that's fine yeah but i just wanted to wanted to double check so would you say like a lot of the work i do um for me emotions i find them very interesting and they definitely i definitely feel an effect on my body but so far i'm i i haven't had any very immediate physical reactions to old traumas but oh you know yeah. maybe maybe you know how to uncover some stuff um wait well because things are under the surface yeah when you're looking at the subconscious mind it requires access over to the subconscious mind so mm. talk therapy like i say yes it does help and it, you know and it can establish stuff and the problems what you might be suffering with but obviously short term it will help but long term it's not so you have to work within the subconscious mind to to clear these problems yeah you need obviously to train your subconscious mind and this doesn't happen um, in one session. You know, the chain, this is why change is difficult and that's why change can take a long time because these things are deep rooted problems. Yeah. You know, if if you've had them for 30 years, it's not something you can get rid of in a session. Sure. So it just takes a lot longer, you know, working through, can clear in your trauma to feel the effect you know yeah. most people some people can feel the effect after a session you know if it all feel better you know some people take about three it just depends on everybody's trauma and what they've suffered mm. and but, sorry just going back you mentioned that yeah. um you had gotten a treatment and the therapist you had been working with said you know you don't need to know what the issue was so in that instance does the therapist themselves uh, know what issue they're dealing with? No, sometimes, yeah, when they clear something, they'll know what they're clearing. Yeah. Um, so my, mine was, um, I think it was a masculinity problem I had. Someone said, oh, you're not muscly enough or mm. not masculine enough sure. to me. And that was a thought form, what was embedded into my body, mm. which caused me basically back pain for six months no not six uh, no four or five months excruciating back pain for that long Hmm. um and until that was cleared you know the back pain was never going to shift yeah but it was just something what was said but the therapist will know what's been said when they do their remote work okay but it's, it's just literally you know there's no point dwelling on it if it's clear and you feel better you know just move on with your life yeah and so do you have um i know in pdtr we talked about very common issues that come up so some things are yeah. more likely to be issues have you found that when treating with crt there are patterns in terms of things that are likely to cause issues whether it be a money or relationships to a parent 
Are there any patterns that you've found? Um, I think sometimes what's on the surface or what they think is not realistically the problem. Sure. You know, and this is where you have to dive down deeper because once you start accessing subconscious mind, things will come up. Mm. So, you know, for example, if if you're not um, if you're frustrated with losing weight, money problems, setting up a business, um, and not getting the results you want, basically, you know, these are problems that are stored within the subconscious mind. Yeah. And for example, like if someone's trying to lose weight all the time, and you see people go to these mad things where they go to the gym, oh, you're on a 12 week plan, lose loads of weight, oh, look great. Mm. Three months after that, they put it all back on because they can't maintain the weight off. Yeah. So obviously that's when the subconscious mind is blocked, there's behaviors, habits, patterns in there, what have to be addressed for, for enable you to be able to keep that weight off. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there sometimes isn't patterns. I mean, I don't, you know, everybody has similar patterns. Hmm. But sometimes, if I, you know, if you said to me, what was my shoulder pain related to? You know, I would have thought because I had a car crash and that's when the pain has started. Yeah. You know, I would have gone after the car crash all day long. But it wasn't the case, you know, and it, and it didn't come up until later when I pulled a brick out and it hurt my finger. Okay. And that's, you know, what resolved my, my, my uh, shoulder pain. Yeah. But yeah, sometimes I can't say what it will be. Mm. It's just I'm actually clearing trauma and see how you feel. Yeah. And so would you argue that something like PDTR is more likely to just catch things on the surface versus the really deep issues? Yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, I've, I've done PDTR clearing with emotions mm. and yes, it does help people. But, uh, you know, I find doing cellular release therapy a lot more deeper clearing. Yeah. Uh, and that's a case where I had um, knee pain, for example. I had a client with knee pain and, sh and hip pain. And I went for the protocol of clearing the knee pain receptors with PDTR. And there was even emotional compound to it through PDTR, which are cleared as well. Cleared the scar where... This person had a sebaceous cyst in the groin, mm. got off the table, no pain. So I said, right. I said, can you just, I literally went back and sabotaged my own work because mm. I needed to know what was there. Yeah. So I got them back on the table and I just got them to re-stim the same point where they'd had a sebaceous cyst and it brought literally everything back. Yeah. So I said, right, I said, we need to clear the trauma or the surgery and all the trauma you suffer with a sebaceous cyst. So once I'd cleared the sebaceous cyst, had the client back in um, after doing the emotional work. Two days later, they had no pain after the emotional work. And I literally went back and checked all my work again and every receptor had cleared and hold. Hell yeah. Okay. And I know in uh, this isn't unique to PDTR, but we talk about it in PDTR as the relationship between certain emotions and then certain organs. And then as a result, certain organs have specific mm. uh, muscles related to them. Do you yeah. find that, um, do you find that that's consistent with your work with CRT that you can, uh, that you can tell that if it's an anger issue, it's going to affect the liver, which is liver, going to affect yeah. specific muscles. Uh, no, we just look at it. I mean, I try not to get bogged down and mm. stuff like that. Yeah. It, for me, it's just clearing trauma sure. and making the client feel better. It yeah. doesn't matter where it's coming from. Yeah. Um, but I think long as you clear the trauma and the client feels better, does it really matter if it's coming from the liver, the kidney, the heart, yeah. the lung, yeah. wherever it may be. Sure. Yeah. No, I like that. that that's good. Because yeah. I, I always kind of struggled a bit with that. I thought, okay, fair enough. But also, it just seemed a bit... Uh, so, uh -huh. so the other issue, see, if you always went for the liver, right, yeah. you've got anger issues because it's anger, anger, anger. So you resolve the anger issues, mm. or whatever method you chose to do it, and then they've still got anger issues or still got problems. You know, is a problem still within the liver? Yeah. Mm. It's probably a habit and pattern and fears, beliefs and behaviors, etc., in the subconscious mind. Yeah, yeah. And that's what makes me think about so many... Like, I'm always thinking about what, what's the deeper motivation behind 
why someone is still in pain because like at this stage we know enough about hip mobility and low back mobility yeah. that these things shouldn't be an issue if it were that simple um, and then you'll see people give uh, mobility programs and they're great mobility programs and some people get better but mm. I feel like they're the kind of people who are going to get better anyway because they had just very basic issues and the people who have these deeply rooted problems are going to continuously fall through the cracks yeah and so we need to understand you know what what motivates this person to do this or more importantly what motivates this person to not do this because we know what healthy behavior is but in spite of all that a lot of the times we don't engage in it so why aren't we willing to engage in it is that something that you see a lot that yes. people have these they're just like the way I kind of think about it is like an analogy I use is the person say you take uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger he walks yeah. into a gym he belongs there that's his world but say you're overweight and you've been overweight your whole life you've got low self esteem I could give you the best program in the world but you walk into that gym and every subconscious program is telling you you don't belong there and yeah. um, is that consistent with the work you do? Yeah, I mean, I often see, um, when I see people, you know, say, well, I haven't got any emotional problems. Mm. <laughs> That's always the number one thing they say to me. Yeah. Well, I say, and I think, well, you don't need no emotional work. You know, and after about 10 minutes, you know, they've probably got six problems. Yeah. <laughs> what I've, you know, I've suggested to them. Um, but yeah, I mean, weight issues, like I say, and that's that can take a little while to resolve because these problems go very very sorry yeah, still there, yeah. yeah some sort of connection so I think we just lost internet yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll cut that out <laughs> but you were talking about um, uh, weight issues are very deeply rooted yeah yeah and obviously you know sometimes it's a protection what people use um, to not to lose weight but uh, yeah, when you see people can't shift weight or they can shift so much weight um, and they can't shift no more, mm. then sometimes you have to do the emotional work. Yes, you have to improve your nutrition. You know, this is all, you know, it's not sometimes all about the emotions, but, you know, emotional work is probably the biggest part of it. But, yeah. you know, you have to eat better. And whatever yeah. method you choose, it doesn't really matter, but you need to eat better. You need to do the emotional work. And then as time goes on, you'll find things will start to improve. Yeah. But like I say, there's no time scale on it. I couldn't even put a time scale on it. Sure. Yeah. Well, then that's fair enough. I, yeah. I, think, I think that's that's another issue we have. It's all very yeah. like, you know, it, it kind of uh, takes the humanity out of the issues. Like you can't separate the individual and the environment from the issue. No. So no. talking about you know, very strict timelines and that kind of thing can be counterproductive. I think so, that's where the industry has gone a bit, yeah. a bit wrong, really, because, you know, oh, we can fix this really quick. Mm. And you might be able to fix something quick, but it, underlying things that just take time, you know, they've yeah. been manifested for quite, you know, something has been manifested for 20 years. It ain't going to go in a session. Do you know yeah. what I mean? It's and I think people just get the wrong side of things when everybody comes out and says, "Oh, we can, yeah, we can fix that in so many weeks." Mm. And I think, I think part of the issue is that we probably don't realize how bad things are, and when like the solution in so many cases, like the the way I'm thinking nowadays, I'm thinking, well, you need a job that's not soul destroying. You need to do something fulfilling. You need to not be weighed down by all of these societal forces and yeah that's not in a lot of cases that's not realistic so you know can i offer a true solution or can i just offer you know a mobility program that's going to you know keep your hips healthy and that's all well and good but i think the gravity of how deep a lot of these problems are is um probably a bit terrifying you know it's certainly terrifying to me in some cases like thinking well you know this is this is a big issue and mm. we're probably never going to get get down to it um so without getting maybe too bogged down in that what do you think 
where do you think we've sort of fundamentally gone wrong with the overall uh, overall treatment of pain and health conditions? Mm, that's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, can yeah. it be boiled down to a couple yeah, of yeah. bullet points? Maybe yeah. not. I, I think sometimes when it's like if somebody doesn't want to do emotional work, something else is created. It's a bit like the drug industry. You know, if you have a cold, they give you a tablet. They'll create a tablet for it. Yeah. You know, if you've got little red patches on, they give you a cream for it. Hmm. You know, there's always other things because people don't want to do treatments because they'd rather just go to the doctor and say, right, I want some tablets for high blood pressure, but I don't want to change my lifestyle. Yeah. You know, if a, if a person is not willing to change, then there's nothing you can do about it. And mm. I think that's part of the reason, and I think that's the world we live in now. You know, mm. it's all about money, you know, emotions. Yes, you have to pay for treatment, but on top of it, you know, there's not really anything to sell from it apart from making, you know, shifting your energy from bad energy to positive energy. And I, I just think, you know, people are happy going and having a crack every six weeks. Yeah. And I think that's just the world we live in. I don't, you know, I don't know why things have gone wrong and why we do things, but I can only assume that, you know, every treatment out there fits to somebody's lifestyle. Yeah. And I think, you know, they're just happy with doing osteopathic stuff, massage, Nutritional stuff, emotional stuff, it all depends what fits the needs. Sure. And I think, you know, like motions is always one of them things that have been pushed to the side because people are just too scared to sort of delve into the past where most of the problems are causing what's happening in the future. Yeah. Or, or present, should I say. Absolutely. So as we sort of begin to wrap up, we're, we're kind of, you know, someone listening to this is thinking, well, okay, I'm ready to confront this this emotional side of things um how could someone work with you what resources do you offer uh, basically how can someone in, in embark on this journey yeah. with you um well I, I work over skype so i mean i've worked yeah. with people in america in ireland in the uk um so there's no limit to where i can work with somebody mm. or i can work with somebody in person I mean, like I say, they can they can get in touch with me. At, you know, if you look for Ian Shepherd Sports Rehabilitation dot com, yeah, uh, that's my website, and obviously on Facebook, Instagram. But that's probably the best way to sort of be able to clear some emotions and trauma if you're yeah. dealing with emotional stuff. Brilliant, and I'll I'll include links to everything, all of your work, and, yeah. and we'll share this in uh, our various uh, social media outlets. Um, I know we both had notes going into this. Is there anything on your side that we didn't cover that you wanted to, to cover? No, I mean, it's... Um, I think with every treatment, you know, you have to give it time, whether it be emotions, osteopathic, PDTR, whatever it may be. Yeah. You know, nothing is a one-session fix, and I think people just need to get out of that mindset. You know, there's a lot of good practitioners out there who work within this field, and um, sure. you just sometimes you got to give these people a little bit of time. Yeah, and um, a lot of the work I do um, in terms of my own sort of self care and uh, on the mm. emotional side of things, I do a lot of writing, a lot of uh, just contemplation and just spending time with my thoughts. Are there any? Uh, obviously, we established that you know for to actually do CRT at that subconscious level, you need yeah. to work with a practitioner. Is there anything that? people can engage in that's going to be beneficial on some level in terms of self-care yeah i mean you know you can imprint daily affirmations i mean yeah. there's there's stuff you can find on youtube but you can mm. listen to for 10 minutes sure you know it's all about just installing positive thoughts and being open and um loving etc yeah. so there's all things you can sort of say to yourself every day mm. and obviously just be aware you know obviously if you're getting triggered by something or you know you're not feeling right just make notes of these things and then yeah. you know just try and either clear them through emotional work or just find some sort of meditation program where you can sort of release these things yeah okay brilliant so all hope is not lost because obviously it's very easy to to work with you once you've got skype 
Um, yeah. But yeah, I think it's always good to have uh, tools and strategies. So that, that's something I found very useful. Uh, I'm definitely going. I'm now. I'm uh, CRT was always sort of on my list of a million things that I'm going to do eventually, but now it's kind of shot up to yeah. the top of that list. Uh, but until then, I, I've got you know things like writing therapy and just writing therapy. Yeah. It sounds fancy. It's just writing, you know, just <laughs> journaling and exploring uh, thoughts and emotions. Um, brilliant. So um, yeah, thank you so much for for taking the time to do this. I think we, I think more than anything, the goal is to just kind of get people to consider the validity and significance of emotions yeah. so that, um, you know, I'm always concerned with the fact that if someone has pain, they'll think, oh, I'll go physio, chiro, doctor. You know, it's obvious, you know, yeah. of course that's an option. But yeah. not many people think, oh, I've got pain, maybe I should see my CRT therapist or yeah. what even is a CRT <laughs> therapist? So I think the goal with with this and this, this kind of content is that one day, whether it's in a year or 50 years or 100 years, mm. the person in pain is thinking, okay, yeah, maybe I should go to my CRT therapist. And that's a widespread thing that people understand. So um, thank you for, for sharing your insight and uh, yeah. playing a part in educating people. So yeah, thank you so welcome. much for taking the time. Yeah, pleasure, pleasure. Well, thanks for having me. <laughs> You're very welcome. So that was my episode with uh, Ian Shepherd. Um, I really, really enjoyed that one. That was great fun. We actually, we kept talking for about maybe 15 minutes after we stopped recording. Um, yeah, it was brilliant. I, I mentioned to Ian that I had a lot of notes. I had a kind of an idea of how I thought the show would go and then it kind of went a different way. And that was great because basically it meant that I that I was learning something new about, about the work he does and, and the intricacies of it. But um, yeah, I think I think the big message, one of the big take home messages from this episode is the importance and the impact of emotional trauma. Uh, even I think I think the point that maybe trauma is a strong word, like it's easy to call it trauma. And we sort of when we say trauma, we kind of think oh, it must be this really big thing that I that I don't want to think about or that I haven't forgotten. Uh, but that even somewhat mild things. Um, in retrospect, mild things can remain in the um, subconscious mind and continue to affect our lives uh, many, many years later. So a couple of things. Uh, I'm actually going to do a bit of work with Ian uh, in the coming weeks or months, um, depending on schedules, and I'm going to do like a report on that. So based on my experience, I'll share what I found. Um, but what I hope is that you heard this and you kind of got thinking about the possibility that your issue might be emotional. I'll be honest, I've never seen um, I've, I've never seen a chronic pain issue that didn't have some degree of emotional component to it because I, I think it's put it this way, like you can't separate your emotions from any kind of significant experience in your life, whether they be good or bad emotions, there is no separation between your experience and and your thoughts and so i think that one of the big things ian said is that people always say oh i don't have emotional issues oh there's no trauma there and chances are there you know there are so again the goal in mind is maybe you've been um maybe you've been in pain for a long time you've tried this you've tried that you've done all the right things you know and this is this is the point i make you're doing all the right things you're engaging with the process you're looking for a solution you're not just outsourcing you're not just going to a doctor looking for pills you want the answer you're looking for the answer but you haven't found it and if you haven't legitimately uh, addressed the emotional side of things then this uh, today this is the episode that's going to push you into that that space where you're finally going to uh, consider the emotional side of things and maybe work with uh, with Ian or someone else qualified in CRT. Um, towards the end, we talked about practical things that you can do without a therapist because CRT obviously requires a trained therapist to work with you, to work at that deeper subconscious level. Um, so if you're not ready to do that, you can do um, affirmations, you can do uh, meditations, hypnosis, you can, there are hypnosis downloads that you can get, I'll, I'll include some links 
I do a lot of that kind of work, a lot of writing, and I've covered this extensively. So maybe that's the way that you can dip your toes into this work and kind of bring things up and, and kind of get a sense of where things are coming from. But um, yeah, if, if, if you feel like you're not getting anywhere and there's this big block that's just not making sense, I think that's that, that, that was a sign that I needed to look deeper was that things just weren't making sense. Like I wasn't getting results proportionate to my efforts and I was doing, quote, the right things. So if that's your experience, uh, I would highly recommend just t talk to Ian, even try try a couple of sessions. Like you said, it, it can take a long time. Uh, but, you know, that's that's just the reality. I think I think the reality of um, chronic pain issues, you know, how deeply rooted these things are is just it's the truth is very very hard to confront i think stre uh, i think life is inherently stressful and really really deeply stressful and i think our society is very very stressful and it's just as much as we've got many luxuries and many great things that we didn't have the pa in the past and i don't i don't want to romanticize the past and i don't necessarily want to go back in time but i think we've we live in a world that's just made to make us dysfunctional and made or maybe not made but it just inherently makes us dysfunctional and inherently will cause problems and until we resolve the wider societal issues we need to get on board we need to start um yeah we need to start realizing how deep these issues go and um, one of the deeper places it goes and one of the most influential places it goes is in our emotions in our subconscious mind so um yeah, I'm rambling. I'm rambling as usual. But uh, yeah, if you, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope it, it was thought provoking. I hope there were maybe a couple of light bulb moments. Please uh, check out Ian's work. He's on Instagram. He's on Facebook. He's got a website. Great case studies, and get in touch with him. Book a session or find, you know, find another CRT provider if you want. Um, but just uh, yeah, take this as as the nudge in in the right direction because I think ultimately. Even if it's not the true answer to your issue, maybe maybe there's it's something different. It's going to shed light um, on on how your body works, how your mind works, and that can only be a good thing. I think uh, I think more knowledge is always going to be good, ultimately. So yeah, thanks so much for listening. If you've listened this far, uh, check out the resources, check out the links, follow Ian, uh, let him know you appreciated his. Um, his appearance uh, I think that would go a long way just uh, any guests that come on I'm gonna try and have more and more guests because I'm running out of things to talk about um, but I'm gonna and also because they've got very valuable things to share that I that I can't share that I don't know but I'm gonna try and have more guests on so uh, as a general rule if you if someone was on and you really enjoyed what they had to say um, send them a message send them a comment on Instagram, whatever, and say, I enjoyed your appearance on the Physical Education Podcast so that they know that their time is well spent and that they are making a positive uh, difference. So yeah, there you go. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll see you in the next episode. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Physical Education Podcast. If you're the kind of person who likes to help others, then share this with someone in need. If you found value in the information here, they will too. So please share this in whatever way you can. If you have any questions, you can email me directly at pa at thebackpaincoach.net. I may even use your question for a future podcast episode. If you'd like more information to help you overcome pain, be sure to follow The Back Pain Coach on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, and to join my newsletter. The major turning points in my own recovery have come from changes in perception and through learning more about myself. I believe that we can help others by sharing information that expands their minds. Finally, I'd greatly appreciate if you could leave a positive review on iTunes or Stitcher so that others may find this information and you can play a positive role in their healing journey. Thanks again for listening.